Adelaide took a deep breath and prepared herself for the next applicant. But before Mrs. Giggs could even call out the name, a commotion erupted in the waiting room. All eyes turned towards the entrance, and even Mrs. Giggs looked puzzled. A man in a sleek black suit had entered, drawing everyone's attention. His jet black hair and piercing blue eyes caught the light, and the badge on his chest, featuring crossed swords and a black panther, demanded respect. Mrs. Giggs greeted him respectfully, addressing him as Sir Lionel Balder. He's applying. Is that really Lionel Balder? Could it be true? Does he really want to be an aide? Who knew Lionel Balder would show up for the interviews? But Lionel remained an enigma. His striking appearance, the air of mystery surrounding him, and the Balder family badge on his chest left no doubt in anyone's mind that he was the real Lionel Balder. The tension in the room heightened as everyone waited with bated breath to see what would unfold. I don't know if it's too late, Lionel said in a respectful tone as he handed over his application without any questions. We'll need you to wait a moment, Mrs. Giggs informed him, and Lionel complied, taking a seat on the sofa in the waiting room. In the waiting room, the commotion went unnoticed by her, but Adele, who was in charge of interviewing the applicants, sensed a subtle change in their attitudes. They seemed either bewildered or unmotivated, unlike the previous ones, making it hard to explain. Adele rubbed her chin and tilted her head, trying to make sense of the situation. Eventually, the tedious interviews ended, and Adele muttered that she had a hard time buying all the applicants' attitudes before burying herself deep in her chair. Just when she thought it was over, Mrs. Giggs rushed in with a stiff piece of paper in her hand. I'm sorry, your majesty. There is only one applicant left, she said, handing over the paper. Adelaide's gaze went through the documents at breakneck speed, but it stopped abruptly. Should we ask for the last applicant? She asked, looking up with her golden eyes glistening like a cold-blooded beast. Adelaide sat on an ornate chair, her eyes fixed on the open door. She looked up when Lionel entered and met his gaze with an intense stare. Lionel felt like he was facing a predator, but he maintained his composure and greeted her politely. Hello, your majesty, he said. Lionel Balder. She called out his name in a deep bass voice and gestured for him to sit down. Adele didn't offer any tea, and Lionel didn't expect her to. The other applicants were treated similarly. Adelaide stared at him, waiting for him to speak. He knew she wasn't interested in small talk or entertainment. She wanted someone who could bring something to the table, and he was convinced he was the right person for the job. He discarded his prepared remarks and got straight to the point, showing her his cold rationality. Are you trying to balance the forces? She countered, her tone sharp. Lionel did not waver. Aren't you looking for an aide to join hands with reliable power in this place where there is nowhere to lean on, and to defend your power and honor against someone who has already occupied the palace? Whoever you choose will be a worse choice than if you chose me. He spoke matter-of-factly, without a hint of bravado or conceit. The Empress's smile faltered for a moment, but she quickly regained her composure. Look, sir. No, should I call you minister? She said, her tone playful. You can call me whatever you feel comfortable with, Lionel replied. Anyway, you really want to be my aide right now, you mean? That's right. Why? The Empress narrowed her eyes, sizing him up. It's been a while since I came here, so I can't read the situation perfectly, but even so, it doesn't seem like there are any benefits to be gained from having Baldur's direct line become my aide. You could have recruited a vassal family or a person from another family whose interests matched and sent it to you as a candidate, but why did you bother to come in person? She continued. Lionel did not hesitate. It's because Her Majesty wants information about the tower she knows. The Empress's interest was piqued. About the tower, she repeated. That's right, Lionel confirmed, his gaze unwavering. Do you believe that the knowledge of the tower outweighs the cost of becoming an Empress's aide? 
Adele inquired, her hand resting thoughtfully on her chin. Lionel replied without hesitation, Indeed, I do. Did I mention that I may call you whatever name I feel comfortable with? She queried suddenly, breaking the silence. Lionel appeared momentarily confused before nodding in affirmation. Yes, your majesty. Lionel, she said, her voice ringing with authority. I am seeking an aid to bolster my prestige and stand against certain factions within the imperial palace. You were correct in your assessment. However, the aid I choose must also pretend to be my lover. Do you understand this? If someone from Baldur's family should present themselves, they will be selected without question, Lionel thought. Adele was well aware of the precarious position he occupied as a direct descendant of a noble family. I will have to call you by your name and speak formally with you that way we'd look like lovers in their eyes. If you're still fine with that then I'll appoint you as my aide. Of course, he replied, I am fine with that. If they think of us as lovers, please appoint your aide your majesty. At this point, Adele's body, weary from three days of interviews, felt as light as a feather dot she thought, looks like I've found an aide who's really to my liking. Who applied? The emperor demanded, his voice low and commanding. After a long pause, the servant finally spoke again. Sir Lionel Balder has responded, the servant replied, his voice shaking. The emperor's eyes narrowed as he processed the information. To the position of the empress mistress. He asked sharply. The servant hesitated for a moment before nodding hesitantly. Yes, your highness, he replied. But, I don't know if he's been chosen. The empress hasn't made an official announcement. The emperor's expression darkened, and a sense of unease washed over him. Dismissing the servant with a wave of his hand, he made his way out to the terrace, his mind consumed with worry. As he stood there, staring out at the moonlit night, he couldn't shake the feeling of dread that had settled in his chest. He had always preferred the darkness to the light, the cold to the heat, he thought. The mysterious sweet scent of Adele still lingers on my nose. The day the Empress came to me, if I had accepted her invitation, drunk on her scent, I'm sure I would have sent Diana away and spent the night with her. How will the noble blooded woman, who is set to be a ruler, become unsettled, and how will her prideful eyes, which look down on me, become agitated? If it happens, I wouldn't have missed even a second, as if it's engraved in my mind. Simply being there, simply existing, is it that challenging, what's so bad about being the quill of a quill pen or a vase holding the flowers, isn't that a life, how should I tame a beast that shows its teeth and claws? He muttered to himself, his voice low and fierce, I will have to pull out all the teeth and claws, but as he spoke the words, he couldn't help but wonder if he was doing the right thing. After Lionel departed, Adele savored a light dinner before, slipping into the soothing embrace of hot water. As the warmth seeped into her limbs, turning them ghostly pale and lulling her into delicious dizziness, she surrendered to the languid pleasure of the moment, basking in the haze of her own thoughts. There was no better balm for her weary soul than this, and so she lay there, content to remain in the water until her consciousness inevitably faded away. She was only roused from her peaceful reverie when her skin broke out in a fine sheen of sweat, signaling that she had been in the bath far longer than she intended. Suddenly, the bathroom door creaked open, and Mrs. Giggs appeared in her usual unflappable manner. Ah, I was just about to leave anyway, Adele murmured, offering a small smile in gratitude to the loyal old lady. Yes, your majesty, Mrs. Giggs replied with a nod. I think you should. Mrs. Giggs continued, His Majesty the Emperor has arrived. She hastily reached for her gown and allowed Mrs. Giggs to wrap it around her shoulders, her wet hair dripping onto the floor. What should I do? Adele asked, suddenly feeling uncharacteristically unsure. To her relief, Mrs. Giggs remained unfazed. As always, your majesty's wishes are my top priority, she replied, stepping aside to let Adele make her own decision. 
Adele said, seems like he has come to ask something regarding Lionel Baldir's visit. Shouldn't at least hear what he wants to ask me. Carl was waiting for her in the drawing room attached to her bedroom. His stern features softened slightly by the sight of her in her light home dress. Adele took a seat across from him on the sofa, unable to shake the feeling that this was all some kind of game. It was a sudden visit, so it took some time to prepare. It's because you caught me in the bath, she said by way of greeting, hoping to lighten the mood. What is it, your majesty the emperor? Adele asked, her voice devoid of any emotion. Carl wasted no time beating around the bush. Who will you appoint as your aide? Adele suppressed a laugh at the emperor's brusqueness, his gaze lingering on it for a moment too long. Well, Adele began. By the way, your majesty, she let her words trail off, watching as Carl's eyes snapped back to hers. Should I report it to you? Carl merely grunted again his impatience palpable. Who will you choose? Adele leaned back against the sofa, allowing a small smile to cross her lips. If this was a game, she was determined. Carl's demeanor remained unchanged as Adele directed her sneer at the emperor, who once again attempted to coerce her into compliance with a shameless and callous expression. Did your majesty obtain my permission? Whomever you may choose, it is my heart that is at stake. Do not ask, Adele asserted. Shall I choose Lionel Balder? The emperor inquired, openly mentioning the name of the potential candidate. Adele's eyes narrowed at the mention, and she shot back, so what? Is there an issue with that? Choose someone else, the emperor commanded. Why? Adele questioned, refusing to back down. Princess Balder and her ilk are enemies of the imperial family. Would you accept such a person as your aide? There is a limit to how far I will tolerate your disobedience. Fulfill your of husband and wife duty accordingly, the emperor replied coldly. Adele felt her blood boil at the emperor's words. She was not a person who could be treated so callously, she thought how shameless he is. And she used same words that emperor spoke to her, just like a feather on a quill or a flower in a vase. Do you want me to live like that? She asked the Empress, her voice echoing with the sincerity of her question. Why do you ask all of a sudden? The Emperor responded, surprised by Adele's sudden outburst. Because it matters, I ask again, do you want me to live like that? Adele repeated, determined to make her point clear. The Emperor's smile, he was unyielding, resolved to keep a tight leash on Adele as if she were a wild animal in need of taming, exactly he stated firmly. I am not a mere accessory, a passive being who accepts everything without expressing my opinion. You want me to be a comfortable partner who comes and goes, but that is not who I am, Adele declared, her words sharp and resolute. For a moment, the emperor was silent, taken aback by Adele's unwavering spirit. Finally, the emperor spoke, his will is firm as ever, okay, I want just that much he said, his gaze unyielding. Adele took a sip of her tea, the bitterness on her tongue and the dryness of her lips mirroring the bitterness and frustration she felt within. Whom shall you choose? Adele's companion prodded, their words hanging heavy in the air. A moment passed before Adele answered, her voice smooth as silk. Lionel Balder. I would choose him, she whispered with a seductive smile. The response elicited a gasp from her companion, who addressed her as, Empress. In shock. Undeterred, Adele continued, pay no attention to my women, and I will not pay attention to your lover either, she repeated. Emperor same words, she reclined leisurely on the sofa, unperturbed by the tension in the room. This is what his majesty said, did you forget, she asked, her voice laced with a hint of amusement. How many times have you seen a lover? Aren't you just protesting against me? Carl challenged her, his voice sharp with irritation. Adele's lips curled into a sly smile, revealing her pearly white teeth. What do you need to look at for a long time? You can come in at a glance, she replied, her gaze fixed on him. 
As the tension between them grew thicker, Carl's expression turned dangerous. Won't you regret it? He asked, his voice low and menacing. Adele did not flinch. Your Majesty, won't you regret it? She countered, her eyes sparkling with fierce determination. He continued, I warned you to be aware of your position. She replied, I don't plan on becoming an added accessory. You told me to fulfill my duty, didn't you? But, shouldn't you first acknowledge me as a spouse on equal footing? Their gazes locked, and the air between them crackled with tension. With a heavy heart, Carl rose from her seat and made her way out of the room with rough steps. As she reached the door, Carl turned back and gave one last warning to Adele. Think wisely, Empress. Don't regret later, she said, her voice heavy with meaning. The words lingered in the room long after Carl had gone. Adele shook her head, her smile turning grim. Think wisely, Adele. Don't regret it belatedly, she murmured to herself. As she contemplated her situation, Adele couldn't help but think of her mother. She wondered if it was just a coincidence that she always seemed to encounter people like Carl, or if it was because those were the only kinds of people who made it to the top. She knew she needed wisdom, but she had no idea where to find it. With a forceful hand, Carl flung open the door, by his side stood Mrs. Giggs, who lowered her head in reverence, Carl, who had been poised to ignore the presence of the maids and proceed on her way, abruptly halted in front of Mrs. Giggs. Is it a person or a position that you are loyal to? He inquired. Your Majesty, the Emperor, Mrs. Giggs replied, her head still bowed. Head. He leaned in and whispered in her ear, I, born to a lowly handmaiden, must be cherished to become an emperor. Do you think I took Princess Elizabeth's place merely because I was born as a man? It's not like that, she replied. He continued, such a lie, I know everything, that's why I'm surprised. When the empress summoned you, I thought you wouldn't come, why, because she's my empress, but you did you, Mrs. Giggs closed her eyes at Carl's contemptuous words and let out a soft sigh. He continued, tell the empress this, then, in order to thrive in my empire and my palace, she must be in good standing with the owner of this place, that way, you too can be by the empress's side, right, isn't that right, nanny? Mrs. Giggs remained silent. Your majesty the empress, Mrs. Giggs said, if you have something to say, say it. I am listening, the empress replied without opening her eyes. Mrs. Giggs hesitated for a moment before speaking, carefully choosing her words. I was the general manager of the imperial palace appointed by Her Majesty, the previous empress, and the nanny of Her Highness the Grand Duke. I know, the empress replied, still with her eyes closed. I took care of one more baby at the same time. It was unofficial, and very few people know about it, Mrs. Giggs continued. The empress opened her eyes slightly, intrigued. Go on, she said. I was also the nanny of His Majesty the present Emperor, Mrs. Giggs revealed, causing Adele's eyes to widen in surprise. Why are you saying that now? The Empress asked. Deep in his heart, is a child who has not yet grown up, Mrs. Giggs said softly, a child who desperately wanted to be loved but never received it, who crouched after receiving a twisted love rather than a correct love. Scene shifts, as the emperor stormed out of the empress palace, he arrived unannounced at Diane's quarters. Upon hearing the news, Diane hastily jumped out of bed and made her way to the emperor. To her, he looked like a beautiful but dangerously poisonous flower amidst the darkness of the night. Carl, stared blankly at the scene unfolding before him. As Diane approached, she carefully studied Carr's expression sensing that the emperor must have been very upset about something. Your majesty, was he displeased by the empress? Diane asked in a soft voice, to which the emperor remained silent and simply looked at her with an enigmatic expression. Sensing his discontentment, 
Diane wondered if it was because of the Empress's aid problem. How could she hire an aide over His Majesty? I really don't get it, she whispered, hoping to placate him. But the Emperor remained silent, fixated on the nape of her neck. Suddenly, he buried his face in her neck and took a deep breath, as if savoring her scent. Diane was startled but managed to call out to him in confusion. After a moment, the Emperor raised his head, his brow furrowing slightly as he studied her face. Why are you like that? She asked in a sudden burst of emotion. Suddenly, Carl spoke in a soft and measured voice, like a feather on a quill, like a flower in a vase. Live like that. The words were cryptic and disjointed, leaving Diane to blink a few times in confusion. After a moment's pause, she flashed a warm smile and replied, it must be a comfortable life, that is. Diane's eyes sparkled with love and contentment as she squeezed Carl's hands and asked, When I become a feather in a quill, will you use it, your majesty? Will you put the vase next to you when it becomes a flower in a vase? She tilted her head coyly, reveling in the sensation of being adored like a treasured gift. Carl's heart fluttered in response to Diane's affectionate words. He felt a sudden urge to seize the nape of her neck and draw her close, like a magnificent and wild creature taming its prey. As Diane looked up at him with playful eyes, he reached out and encircled her slender neck with his hand. Holding her like a leash, he pressed his thumb against her lips, feeling the softness of her mouth give way to his touch. As he squeezed her lips, he imagined them as fragile flower petals, crushed and molded to his will. Diane parted her lips and lightly nibbled on his thumb, savoring the heady sensation of being under Carl's spell. The eyes will be blurred, turning red and cloudy, the emperor warned. But the subsequent actions of the monarch were a far cry from what Diane had anticipated. Without warning, the emperor abruptly withdrew his hand, leaving Diane's eyes to widen in surprise. His fingertips were slick with moisture much like her own luscious, glistening lips. Your Majesty, she inquired, her voice soft and tinged with regret and doubt. The Emperor, however, ignored her thin voice and turned away from her, his demeanor cold and aloof. He stormed out of the room without a word, leaving behind no trace of lingering emotion, as if he had been summoned by something urgent. At the sight of his swift departure, Dian's heart began to flutter ominously. I'm not someone who can be denied, he never ignore my seduction, what is this now? Diane's eyes shook violently as she tried to make sense of the perplexing encounter with her beloved emperor. The tale of Mrs. Giggs had unfolded over an extended period, her struggles as the late empress leaving her in a state of constant distress. But the pinnacle of her anguish was reached when her lady-in-waiting, Yi, bore the emperor a son. The emperor declared the child the empress's adopted son and heir, a decision that neither the former empress, who could not bear children, nor the birth mother could accept with ease. The child, separated from its biological mother, was raised in the palace, much to the chagrin of the former empress. At six years old, the child learned that the mother she thought was hers was actually a stepmother who despised her deeply while her true mother was half-mad and insane by the time she visited at age seven. Such a twisted upbringing was bound to leave its mark. Mrs. Giggs had shared this story with Adele, hoping to improve the relationship between the emperor and the empress, for understanding another's story is the foundation of building meaningful connections. Despite this, Adele showed no sympathy for the emperor, lacking a deep understanding of the empress herself. Adele let out a long sigh, brushing her hair back to reveal her shining golden eyes amidst her dark locks. When I first met the emperor, he was hostile towards me, and I wondered why. You said it was because he saw me and the previous empress on the same level. What does that mean? Adele asked. Your majesty, Mrs. Giggs replied, I mean that I was worried as soon as I arrived here. When did I ever meet Emperor Emont before? I even saw his portrait for the first time on my way here. 
How baffled I must have been by his hostility. But I never thought it would stem from a deep-seated attachment and resentment towards the position of Empress itself. What is there to compare between me and the previous Empress? Adele continued. It's an unconscious reaction, not a rational decision, Mrs. Giggs explained. It's problematic when the highest ruler has instincts that overpower reason, Adele exclaimed, her anger flaring up. But, as you said, he is the supreme, Mrs. Giggs added hesitantly. And, Adele prompted, Your Majesty, he is the most high and your Majesty's consort, Mrs. Giggs responded. And, Adele repeated, growing impatient. So, it is imperative that you humble yourself and accept the authority of the Empress to please the Emperor. Did you not think that Lionel Balder's arrival would displease the Emperor? Mrs. Giggs asked, not shying away from the truth. Adele was furious, her chest boiling like lava, as Mrs. Giggs looked on with a perplexed expression. On the first day I arrived, Diane Poitiers came to see me and offered to enlighten me on His Majesty's preferences, Adele stated. Mrs. Giggs' eyes flared with anger. How dare she? She dared to come to me and say it. She instructed me to conform my appearance to His Majesty's preferences. Mrs. Giggs bowed her head and apologized. I'm sorry. You need not apologize, Mrs. But what distinguishes what you said to me just now from what Diane Poitiers said that day? Your Majesty the Empress. Do you know what I told her? I claimed that she had never considered attempting to mold me to someone else's preferences. She spoke firmly reminding herself and her elderly lady of her true purpose. The Empress understood that her beliefs and values were her guiding principles, the very foundation of her identity. She refused to compromise them for anyone or anything, even if that meant clashing with the Emperor himself. The most important thing in the world is none other than me, Adelaide itself, she whispered, reaffirming her sense of self. That's ahead of the position of emperor. So, he is dead when he dies, but he can never obey the command to hold his breath and wield whatever he wants. Do you understand? Mrs. Giggs nodded slowly, her eyes downcast. Empress Adelaide continued with a sense of finality. If you find it difficult to have me as the empress, feel free to tell me. I'm really sorry. I cross my line, Mrs. Giggs murmured, but Adelaide was already turning away. In less than an hour after storming out of the Empress Palace with an angry expression, the Emperor returned, his face contorted with a dangerous intensity, resembling a dark fire. Mrs. Giggs, who had rushed out with a surprised look, was caught off guard when the Emperor stopped in front of her. Is the Empress available for a joint audience today? The Emperor asked his question directly and to the point. Mrs. Giggs was taken aback and unable to respond. The emperor scrutinized her face for a moment before muttering, seeing as you cannot answer, it appears that it is indeed possible. With that, the emperor left the bewildered Mrs. Giggs behind and strode into the empress bedroom with a sense of purpose. Adele was just about to fall asleep when Karl barged into her bedroom without so much as a knock, his tyrannical spirit on full display. His abrupt intrusion left her speechless. What are you doing? She managed to blurt out. I want to spend the night with you, he declared, his eyes full of an intense, dangerous energy that reminded Adele of a glass of overflowing wine. He thought, an emperor is someone who always gets what he wants. He has no reason to hesitate or suppress his desire, even if the other party is the Empress. But Adele's eyes were filled with a different kind of energy, one that could kill, despite his desire, Carl could sense her reluctance. You said you'd regret it less than an hour ago, yet now you want to suddenly have a first night together. Don't you think we should first acknowledge each other as spouses? She questioned him. Carl kneeled on the edge of her bed the sweet scent of spring flowers surrounding them. You seem to be struggling to gain proper power in the imperial palace. What more do you need to go back to? 
As the Empress, it is your duty to do your job and gain your strength. I will hold it in my hand, he told her, trying to convince her to give in to him. As Carl's hand gently pressed against Adele's shoulder, the Empress remained unmoved, her expression devoid of any passion or enthusiasm. Carl stepped back, taking in the chill emanating from her demeanor. It's complicated, he said, and Adele was taken aback. Was she considering seizing power as Empress without fulfilling her duties? The thought sent shivers down Adele's spine. Despite being her spouse, their first night together was a natural obligation. It was only fitting, but Adele couldn't shake off the feeling of dirtiness that came with it. As she looked at the distorted expression on the Empress's face, Carl whispered, What I said, is it so degrading? Is there anyone else in this empire whom you would bow to besides me? Adele snarled in response, Is it the Empress's unconditional obligation to bow to the Emperor? Is that how it is in Emont? Carl gazed at her with intense focus, revealing a small, white foot. The foot was delicate, reminiscent of a wild beast's, and Carl lowered his head slowly, holding her ankle with one hand. As he stared into Adele's golden gaze, his purple eyes ablaze, he kissed the tender spot where he had entered. Something soft and squishy fell from Adele's ankle with a wet sound. The emperor lifted Adele up and whispered, gazing at her with intense focus. Now that I have bowed my head and kissed your feet, are you satisfied? Adele had been born into a flawless royal family with a perfect lineage, and her proud, arrogant face was befitting of her upbringing. She had lived a life free from the constraints of submission. As Carl leaned forward, his movements reminiscent of a carnivore biting into its prey, he cupped Adele's cheek with one hand. As he trailed his hand down the nape of her neck, a sense of immense pleasure surged through him. He let out a low sigh as he traced her red lips with his thumb intending to press her chin down and force his way into her gaping mouth. But a cold voice cut through the moment. Let go, Adele said. Despite her warning, Carl did not release his grip on her neck. As the two locked eyes, a golden glint flickered in Adele's gaze, and her lips curled into a cold smile. She cut off Carol's hand, and his eyes filled with displeasure. You do not know your place, he said icily. He continued, you chose to protect your ego by baring your teeth, even when your grand pride is the only thing you possess. I really can't understand you. Kneel down to me, bow your head, submit. Adele recoiled, spitting out her response with defiance. I will not, I won't. He continued, you will regret it someday. Carl studied Adele's face, then took a step back. She had no idea how contorted her expression had become. Seeing the disheveled state of the Empress, he felt satisfied, even though the heat had dissipated. She remembered how everyone is, just like her mother. They all wanted to hurt her pride and want her to be obedient girl just as they wanted. She didn't even know when she fell asleep. She felt a touch on the tip of her abyss with her fingertips. Could it be that the devil crawled out of the darkness and embraced her from behind? It's Hannah Giggs, your majesty. Did you cough? Her agitated heart cooled. Come in, Mrs. Giggs appeared with the same face and appearance as yesterday. What's going on? She asked with a cold tone. Mrs. Giggs was silent for a moment at the question's cold tone. It was a moment that felt like time had stretched out. His Majesty's Majesty has ordered that the Empress Palace's budget supplementary budget be cancelled. Even that was news from the Ivory Palace. Just like that, when the news of the loss of the supplementary budget of the Empress Palace hit the palace like a fire spreading in a dry field, the Empress Palace also set up a counterfire without losing. Appoints Lionel Balder as assistant to the Empress.